I got news for you. Man, I'm going through it. And it's tough. As a matter of fact, it's rough. As a matter of fact, it's so rough and tough, it's not even a glad bag. It sucks. In other words, I hate it. I don't like it. I don't want to go through it. But I am in it. And when you're in it, if you understand what I'm trying to say here, you need to realize why you're in it, what you're in it for, and who's doing it to you. You see, there's a lot of people that tend to look at trials, if it's really a trial, or tribulations, if it's really a tribulation, or some challenge to your faith as though it were something, oh my God, the devil's got me. Well, he had to ask permission first, so if he does have you, somebody's behind the scenes behind him. Kind of like uh, pulling the strings, so to speak. Somebody's got control of the whole shebang and the ball of wax. You got to get a grip on what's going on so you know who to go to for what you're doing with when you're going through it before you do something that's stupid. Hey, see, I'm, I'm really going through it. And I kind of knew I was going to go through it and I knew it was going to happen because of how it happened and what happened. And so, because I've made a choice to go in a certain direction, God had inspired me to point my faith and my walk, my talk, my ministry, my choices of what I'm being involved in in a certain direction. I knew that going in that direction as a blessing as it was so quickly that I would be challenged greatly. I would be crucified completely, that I would be nailed to the cross and I would be like, boy, crushed and stuffed, you know, and mounted on the wall as a trophy for God's grace and mercy. Yeah, dead up there, stuffed. You know, taxidermy on Michael. <laughs> yeah, hello, dude, get a grip. And that's what the reality of what trials and tribulations are meant to do. Kill you. Yeah, really. And so, before this trial ever started, I really had a prayer request, you know, and I, I wanted to go up, and I almost did. Uh, the guy, uh, that I, I like to watch in action because he's, he's got a crack up. He's always, you know, he's always a you know, little happy bowl of wax, you know, I mean, well, bowl of wax. He's always, he's always a good guy to watch, you know. And so I just kind of noticed him always at the corner of my eye, you know, and he's kind of an observant person so he can see around, you know, so I kind of duck behind pillars. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. No, but he's a, he's a blessing, you know, he's a real good blessing and I like him, you know, and I like what the Lord is doing with him, you know, and how he affects and inspires the environment that he's in because God uses him in that capacity. Other people have the same ministry, but some of them kind of stick out like a sore thumb. You know, they kind of like, they look like they're a pillar of the, the ministry or they look like they're in ministry. But Joe just looks like he's Joe. I mean, you know, he just, just Joe. I mean, you know, and you know, if you know Joe, you know. So there you go. <laughs> and that's the way I would bless him. You know, I was like, well, it's Joe. You know. It's the way I would talk about him, you know, to the Lord. You know, hey, it's Joe. You know, you know, Lord. Joe, yeah, and Joe, you know, Joe and the Lord are on a first name basis, you know, they're kind of intimate that way. And so I thought about it a while ago, you know, before I did my famous epic, you know, massive, stupid action of trying to ride a bicycle 21 miles, you know, in an hour or two in order to get to church. Whew, about killed me, too. But that was part of the trial. But you see, I had prayed before that, that knowing these things were coming, that, Lord, pour it on get a hold of me, grab me by the scruff of the collar, take me by the shoulders, shake me, make me, break me, you know, and take everything you want. Fire up that furnace, God, you know, just stoke some more wood. Let's get it on. Let's get real. Let's get over it. You know, let's get on with it. And so, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm not stupid. I see, you know, the writing on the wall. You know, I, I know what, you know, many, many tekalufu means, you know, how far so. You know, and I do see clouds, you know, when they're on the horizon. You know, I know what a thunderhead is. I know when there's going to be storms. I can see storms coming, you know, ahead of time. You know, kind of like, oh boy, here we go. You know, it's almost like we used to say, you really want to mess up a Christian? Bless them, because believe me, after the blessing, they're not ready for the trial. But hey, you know, when I found this body of believers that I knew I was going to be a part of, I knew the trial was going to come, and it was like. <sighs> And I always get challenged because I'm older in the faith in areas that are personal to me. Because I've been around a long time and I've been through lots of trials and tribulations. I've been lots of growth stages, you know. I laugh because I think about a growth stage. 
You know what a growth stage is? You know, if you have a tomato plant, you know what a growth stage is. You see, tomato plants are kind of weird, at least some of the ones that I got. If you water them, they grow tall. If you stop watering them, they grow fruit. They take what moisture's in the ground and they bear fruit, you know, because they suck up the last of the water. You know, they take, they start using productively that which they had abundantly. Now, because there's an abundance of water, they don't produce fruit because there's an abundance of water. They're not in the midst of a trial. They're not going through where they don't have, they're not, they're going through a time of abundance of water where they have too much water, so they use it to grow up and to grow out and to grow wide and to grow strong and, well, not really strong, but to really grow like crazy. And they'll like shoot out vines every direction that they can. And then they'll put out little flowers, but they won't produce fruit. They just will not. They'll put out even more flowers and more flowers and more flowers. The flowers will die and they'll still wait to produce fruit. They will not produce fruit until they start drying out. Because the deep waterings, you know, down in the deep parts of the roots where the, the feeder type modules or nodules of the, the roots that the tomato plant has, it has to start sucking from there in order for the, the plant to know, hey, fruit time, time to bear fruit. And so they don't grow until they know that they've got less water and they're not as watered full as they have been. They go through a time of dryness, a time of sucking up what they have and using to the maximum amount what they were given. And that's kind of neat because, you know, that's what God's doing with me. Hey! <laughs> you know, I get blessed for a while and all of a sudden it's like kaboom, kabom, and wow, where do we go wrong? You know, and that's what a lot of Christians say. When they run into something that they don't understand, they say, where did I go wrong? Maybe you went right. Hey, that's the point of this message. You can be doing everything right and then find yourself in God's sight. And God wants to do something with you. So he's going to, like old Benny Hester used to say, he's going to squeeze you just because he loves you. <laughs> and you'll know him better for what he brought you through. And you know, the older you get, the more you recognize when you're being squeezed like juice, then you recognize when you're being taught like a schoolmaster. You know, because the law was our schoolmaster and it kind of beat us up, you know, and that's what some people get lots of times when they don't understand what's going on in their life. They're out, you know, condemning or, you know, claiming or defaming God by saying that it's the devil doing it to them or something, you know, and in reality, you know, God may be trying to teach you a lesson, you know, you, know, you may want to look in a mirror, you know, kind of examine the word and go, hey, Lord, what are, you, what are you saying here, you know? The older you get, the more you know, okay, now I know, I got you, Lord, so now that I know I'm in a trial, pour it on! And so that's why I didn't really go to Joe at the time, because I wasn't sure how he'd react, you know. I don't know if he's like, you know, Jesus freak where we said, Hey man, you know what? I'm going through a trial, man. I just told the Lord, you know, fire up that furnace, man. Burn it out. Kill the dross, you know, make gold pure, you know. You know, take me into the Holy of Holies, you know. Hey, let's go there. And quite frankly, nobody really wants to dive in. To me. <laughs> Is it freezing outside? Let's dive in the water if God says go. Hey, is it burning outside? Let's go wander in the wilderness if God says go. Hey, you know what? If it's a mountaintop and there's thunder and lightnings and oh my God, there's all kinds of storms up there. What do we do? Let's go if God says go. And so, because I know it's a trial, because I know it's the Lord, because I see his handiwork being wrought in me, I can say to you, open up to the book of James. <laughs> I laugh because there are some people that would know exactly what I'm thinking every time I open the book of James. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I like the book of James because my middle name is James. I'm very intimate with the book of James. I've gone through a lot of trials. <laughs> so I know James pretty good. Matter of fact, I enjoy James. And everybody, even if you've been through a study in James, will get something different out of James because at any point in time, God will use James for you. God will take James and make you applicable to it, or God will take James and teach you through it. One way or another, he's going to do it. <laughs> you like the way those alliterations work? Sometimes I can tell when you know I've had enough sleep, because then what happens is that in my life, I actually kind of like get in the flow. You know, it's like you're kind of flowing with what God is doing, and you're growing in the grace that he's given you. So 
what happens is that out of your mouth comes all kinds of neat little things and little tricks and trips, you know, that you've been laid on and taught from earlier days and then kind of like a course in thing, you know, or like some of the other Bible scholars that or Bible teachers that were around at the time that I was learning. You know, you kind of pick up some of their patterns. Only I've got kind of my own because I go out into left field, you know, and I check out what that's like. I go out into center field, check out what that's like. You know, and then I'll go out in the right field, kind of see what that's like. I'll go up in the bleachers, you know, I'll kind of go out, look in the parking lot. You know, I'll come back to home base, you know, take a few swings, you know, and I'll go over to first base, you know, I'll go center field, you know. And I'll go, you know, check out second base, you know, check out third base. Matter of fact, I kind of check out the whole grounds, you know. I kind of go all over the place, that's what I'm trying to say. So in James, it's kind of interesting when you start in James because. James, if you really read it, you know, you don't really need verses and numbers and books and chapters because it's technically a letter that was sent, you know. Yeah, you know, letter, the kind that you write down, you know, that you seal up, you know, put a stamp on it and send it. Well, that's what they used to do in those days. And a lot of people didn't have all of the Word of God. So imagine when you only have certain portions of the Scripture that you're going to hang on to. Imagine if you only know a certain amount of what you've been told. Imagine if you're like a new Christian that only knows a little bit of the Bible. But that quality of what you know, you know. Because, you know, you grabbed a hold of it. You were like that tomato plant that was like with the feeder, you know, kind of nodules that are on the root plants that are sucking up the water. You know, you know that you want to suck it in as much as you can get. And you want it. You don't have it, so you want it, so you go after it. So you learn John 3.16. I mean, obviously, you know, God's a, lot, a lot of people learn that first. Matter of fact, a lot of people are taught, you know, when they're discipled, you know, hey, let me give you, you know, a baby New Testament, which is what I was given, you know, and then read the book of Matthew, or read the, <laughs> read the book of Matthew. <laughs> That's what I read. Read the book of John. Am I stupid? Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? I call my sleeves. Presto. I didn't read John. I looked at it, you know, and they said, well, we John. I looked at John 1. I went, let's turn to John 1. Uh, you know, just, just to give you an example of how my mind works. Does it work? <laughs> but let's look at John 1. I mean, everybody knows it because everybody usually starts there, and they always get this kind of like, you know, I don't know what they get out of it because personally me, I got, what? You know, first thing I did, I looked at it and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What? Uh, you know, I mean... I'm a sci don't get me wrong. Now I'm a sci-fi guy. You know, I grew up in sci-fi. I read all kinds of, you know, Heinlein and Asimov and Norton and all, all all kinds of classics as well as, you know, modern and you know, kind of all kinds of people, you know, and I really enjoyed sci-fi. You know, my mind kinda of went there, you know, I kinda of have a high IQ for all the amount of reading that I used to do, you know, and my mind is high IQ also because I'm able to analyze and see patterns and all these kind of things that they say that they measure IQ by, you know, this, you know, relationships and all that kind of stuff. Well anyways, you know doesn't mean much because quite frankly you know what you do with it is more important than what you got quite frankly the same way with the tomato plant tomato plant can do certain things but you know what if it don't bear fruit it ain't worth it <laughs> it's nice to look at but guess what it's not the prettiest flower in the world so when I read first John I mean first John first John's kind of good but when I read John I went in the beginning was the word why you know the word was with God was with. the same was in the beginning with John I didn't get it you know, I even went to three and went, all things were made by him. Went, okay, who's him? I mean, you know, there's there's no real explanation here. I mean, for a guy that had no religious upbringing, I looked at John and said, are you kidding me? And skipped it. So I went over, you know, and I kind of had a one of those, you know, little mini New Testament, because that's what they gave me. In those days, they didn't have the, you know, whole Bible, you know, little Bibles that they were giving out free. They gave me a New Testament. I said, that don't make no sense to me. And so the first book in this mini New Testament I had was, Matthew. So I said, oh, okay, let's go to the beginning. That don't make no sense. Why do they want me to skip certain parts of the Bible? You know, like I said, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> so I went into, you know, and found out that there was a book, you know, and there was a thing called the New Testament, and I went, mm, okay, you know, I knew what a testament was, but I didn't know because of the Bible. I knew because of sci-fi, but, you know, kind of went, all right, you know. And I went, in the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, I go, that's what I want to know. And so I started reading from Matthew. Go figure. I still, to this day, have no idea why people keep telling everyone to go to John. That's the way my mind works. I don't see in my discipleship, and I've never told anyone to go to John. I don't tell people, hey, look, you know, study, start in John. Matter of fact, I think that's probably the weirdest way to learn Bible and to learn about Jesus. I went into Matthew and I went, 
the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Ah, oh, cool. Abraham. I know Abraham begat Isaac. Oh, Isaac. Yeah, okay. Isaac begat Jacob. Yeah, all right, cool. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. You know, I kept going down through, and I was like, man, cool. You know, look at that genealogy. Man, that is cool. Look where he came from. Look what he's going through. You know, look who he knows. You know, I went, Ammon. You know, is he an Ammonite? Kind of, yeah, that's kind of weird. You know, now I noticed things, you know, like Solomon begat Robo, and Robo begat Abia, you know, Joseph that. And, you, know, you know, I kind of kept looking through, you know, and I was like, until they were carried away to Babylon, I went, ooh, wow, yeah, all right, you know, it's okay. And then, so, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. I went, now that's interesting, 14 generations. I said, I wonder how long that is, you know. And so then I went on to David and the carrying away to Babylon at 14. I went, ooh, this is kind of interesting, 14, 14. And then it says, and from the carrying away to Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. Whoa, three 14s. Man, that's cool. And you know, I was gone. You know, I was already into it. And then I went, you know, by the time I got down to verse 18, you know, I was already excited because I was kind of like, wow, I'm noticing things. And then it made perfect sense because here I've just found out his lineage, and then it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this one. All right. And so you see, I wanted to know about Jesus. I, I want to know about this word thing. You know, what the, what the heck is the word? You know, I mean, I didn't get it, you know, because I wasn't in the church, you know, and maybe some of you guys, you know, that are a little different, a little weird, you know, a little strange. Maybe you got it when you were told, uh, read the book of John and just keep reading till you get it. If you don't get it, just keep reading, you'll get it. It didn't make no sense to me because, you know what, I wanted to get it right away. You know, what I got when I got saved was a big blessing. You know, I mean, I got all kinds of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, you know, but I still had some questions, you know. And I got a lot of things, believe me, that a lot of people don't get when they get saved. I was like, ah, you know, like way out there. <laughs> You know, I'd been running around the bases, you know, and I hadn't moved in one place. Just got saved, opened my eyes, and I felt like I'd already been through all the fields. So, when I began to read and study, I started in Matthew. Later, when I finally, you know, was at Calvary Costa Mesa, you know, I went to school of the Bible, and by golly, everybody was saying, you know, that you can't be taught by a woman, and, you know, they were all arguing about this woman that was coming to Calvary to teach a Bible study. And I went, well, why not? You know, she happened to be Jewish, which I didn't, you know, really care one way or the other. You know, boy, you know, that's who need. You know, hey, I wasn't raised my heritage, you know, in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, I'm a bastard kid, so I really wasn't raised with much of anything. You know, kind of like one of those out of wedlock. You know, when it came to the other woman, my mother was the other woman. Oops, we can't talk about that. God can't use people like that. They're like over there. Never mind, you know, all the lineage of Jesus and where some of his lineage came from. Rahab? <laughs> Excuse me? You know. So anyways, the point being is that I was amazed when, you know, Calvary had a woman teacher and she was going to teach in Matthew. She said, you know, the best book that you could learn from, you know, is the book of Matthew. I went, wow, Lord, this is cool. You know, I had a relationship with Jesus. The moment I opened my eyes, like, God was talking to me and I was talking to God. Didn't understand everything, you know, not really. But boy, when she said that, I went, cool. And she started off with the 14 generations, you know, and the memory tricks that Jews use and the way that genealogies are structured in order to repetitiously say them verbally, because a lot of history was verbal communication, and that you should be able to set, and then later on when I met another Jew, you know, from Chosen People Ministries, uh, Scott Brown, he told me that, you know, the way that a lot of people learn, you know, in Western culture is interesting, you know, and it's good, and it's wonderful, and it's powerful, you know, and it's magnificent, and God has used, you know, the church in order to minister to a lot of people, you know, and it's starting with Jews, and it's ending with Gentiles, and it's going to be, you know, the fulfillment of what God intended, and all those things. But he also told me something interesting. He said when he went to Bible school, you know, because there was one in Alaska, they had a Bible that had no numbers, no chapter divisions. I went... Really? Wow. So I kind of read the Bible one time that way, and I was like, wow, that was powerful. It was interesting. And then he also said something else. He said to me, Michael, what would happen if you didn't have your Bible to carry around? Whoa. My Christianity changed in that moment forever. And I just began to realize, I don't memorize. And I'm not going to memorize. I'm not going to memorize the scriptures. I'm not going to sit down and go by rote. Because for me, that's like, you know, repetition, vain repetition, just, you know, you know, that's a magpie. I can listen to magpies, but I want magpies. You know, I can listen to a recording if I want to hear a recording. But what do I think about the scripture and how do I understand it? And that's what he taught me. 
how do you relate the scriptures and how do they impact you in your life and what are they? Because you see, I don't know that you hear what I say. I only know that I say and speak a certain thing that I'm sharing and relating at a certain point in time in my life and when I do, I know that it goes forth and it accomplishes the purpose that God intended, but I have no idea what that purpose is until you tell me what you heard. Until you tell me what you saw. Until you tell me what you experienced. Because you see, at Sinai, this is a famous statement, you know, that Jews make, you know, that we all Jews were at Sinai. You know, it's kind of like you know, metaphysical, metaphorical, you know, kind of like you know, mystical. Well, you know, everybody's got those, you know, at some point in time in their Christianity of some place, or their religious ideas, or their heritage, some kind of mystical ideas. And you know, the Jews all say, well, you know, we're all one, one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. You know, that's the same idea. Every Jew was at Sinai. You know, same idea. It's giving credit to God that before the foundations of the world, he inscribed us and writ his name in the book of life, and that if he takes you out of the book of life by blotting it out, then you're no longer in the book of life, so that you're going to not go to heaven, but you're going to go to hell. So the, the principle is there. It's just said in a different way, in Jewish way, as opposed to Christian way. The Jewish way of saying, you know, your name, before the foundations of the world, your name was written in the book of life. The Jewish way of saying that is, all Jews were at Sinai. Okay, cool. And the point being is this, they were at Sinai, but what did they see? Some saw thunder, which is an interesting thought, think about that for a minute. It didn't say saw lightning, it said saw thunder, that's not a misquote. Some saw lightning, some heard God, some heard thunder, some were fearful of God, some didn't hear God or see God at all. Interesting, isn't it? So that's why a lot of times some of the things that you go through or you may teach if you're in ministry or you're going through if you're being applied to, by God in his way of teaching you, then it may not be the same thing even though the person next to you may hear the same thing, they may get a little different out of it because they're a little different. They're weird. You're not. <laughs> You're perfect, right? Right. Got that covered. Woo. You're not in left field. You're at home plate. You're the umpire. i seen some of you on the bleachers. Now, having said all that, Maybe I did learn from Matthew first, and maybe I did, you know, kind of like stand at Sinai, you know, so to speak. Maybe I am kind of weird, you know, maybe I am going through some trials, and maybe I do know from the Jesus movement that we love to say, hey, if you're going through it, get to it, get in with it, get on it, learn from it, grow with it, and know it. And so, looking at the book of James, as we go back to now the point of what we were talking about, and being in trials and tribulations, and going through those things that are meant to challenge you, to question you, to make you get to the heart of, like, ouch, and to hurt, and to suck up, you know, what you really need, sustenance from God himself, not from, you know, religion, and not from, you know, people's ideas, and not from, you know, some other perspective, or some other way of looking at things, but rather from the Spirit of God, as he moves in your life, and he's trying to get his point across by putting you into a challenge, a trial, a tribulation. James, a servant of Jesus Christ and of the Lord Jesus, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are in scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and greatest not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in his all way. And let the brother of low degree rejoice when he is exalted, and let the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof faileth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he with us the word of truth, that he would be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
For the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superflu superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. And whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Interesting. You may want to focus in on that as the point at verse 25. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but to see this his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. His religion. Pure religion and undefiled before the God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And it goes on. But you know, the point I wanted to talk about is God. God, we say there's no respect for persons, yet he warns the rich man. He rewards the poor man. He gives blessings to the poor man. He gives blessings to the rich man. He says certain things all the way through the scriptures that he's always kind of reminding, hey, you know, your riches really are going to carry you away. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's nice to be wealthy, but you know, it's kind of like with the, the poor man. When a poor man cries out, he wants something, and he wants it bad, and he wants to get it, and he needs it, and he needs it now. When a rich man cries out, he's not asking for something that he really wants. He's asking for something he wants to get. You see? the difference? A rich man doesn't have to have it. He's got what he wants. He's got more than enough. But he wants a little more. He gets a little more. He sometimes can use it in a way wisely, but for the most part, I'm sorry, a rich man is a warning from God. And God warns the rich man consistently, persistently, and continually. And I don't care what kind of ministry you've got, you shouldn't be basing your ministry upon how many wealthy people you got in your church and whether the church is being supported by those wealthy people that are in your congregation and your body. You ought to be telling those people, hey, you know what? Get a hold of yourself. Examine yourself. Find out if you're consumed by your wealth or whether you're turning your spiritual health over to something else other than the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and delivering your wealth unto Him to manifest it the way He wants to as opposed to the way the rich man wants to. And that's why God does have a lot of warnings to the rich man because when He said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because He wasn't kidding, you know, it wasn't about the fact that there's some kind of, you know, arch that's supposedly called, you know, the eye of the needle or, you know, He was saying, hey, you know what? He's talking to women. You know, women know what knitting is. Women know what sewing is. It's easier for a woman, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven because that's how hard it is. It really is. And I know I've ministered to rich people and I've talked to rich people and I've worked for one, you know, billionaire or millionaire in Alaska, you know, and man, I can tell you, after everything is said and done, when they're alone, they're counting their gold because it's about money. It really is. Business is business and that's the way it is. It's money. And you know, it's kind of interesting. I always learned how to make money. I don't have any problem knowing how to make money. I choose not to. You know, I choose to go with what God is doing in me. And so, going through this trial right now, it's fascinating because God hit me right in the place where it hurts. Money. He crushed me, touched me, makes me into that challenge that most people find. They go, well, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, sort of. You know, it's true, the scripture does say some things about that. About, you know, let him who is able to work, work. Let him who is able to, you know, produce, produce. Let him who is in this type of thing do what he's supposed to do. But you know, Elijah was doing what God said to do. And he went where God told him to go. And he did what God told him to do. And yet, at some point in time, sitting in a cave, he was fed without doing anything. And that's a fact. Jack. And I know in my life, not because I'm a prophet, and I'm not, <laughs> although we always talk about, you know, gifts of the Spirit and what the Spirit of God is, and the, you know, the way that some people interpret prophecy today, or prophets, is the speaking forth of God's Word by the affirmation of the verbal communication of that with which is written in the Word, because they're worried about whether or not prophets are going to be off the wall. And yet, you know, we had people like, you know, Catherine Coleman, you know, I mean, God bless her, I don't know much about her, you know, but I know that Chuck, you know, knew, knew her. You know, and um, 
I know that there are different ministries that operate in certain different capacities where they quote unquote have prophets. I know I've dealt with a lot of prophets at different times, and most of them I've had to challenge directly because of some of the things they say about the Word of God that's false or untrue. And they're learning, you know, and they learn that they don't want to mess around with somebody from Calvary that knows the Word of God because guess what? <laughs> we know the Word of God. <laughs> it's like, uh, I got news for you, dude. You know, you know the story about the old prophet and the new prophet? Hey, you, you know, you're kind of like new to this, aren't you? He's like, well, yeah. Well, then come on over to my house and spend the night, you know, because I know the Lord told you to do one thing, but I'm telling you to do something else because the Lord told me to tell you that. Learn that lesson and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But in my life, in dealing with right now, counting it all joy, we're looking at verse 2 and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Jesus said, in the way we should pray and about prayer, you know, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, the point is, when you fall into something, it's you fell. And that's what James is trying to make the point of. If you fall into temptation, then there's an opportunity for a choice to be made. Because you don't have to be led into temptation. You don't have to be presenting yourself in that environment where you could be tempted. You will be tempted irregardless. No matter where you go, what you do, how you think, what you are, how you feel, what your perspective is, or how safe you try to make your home, or your environment, or your society, or your people around you, or even you know your mindset, or putting a little box on your forehead so you focus in, or you know structuring your time so that you're consistently always reading the Torah. You're going to be tempted. That's just a fact. And it says when you fall into temptation, into diverse temptations. Notice that there's more to it than what meets the eye. It's not just simply a temptation because it's often misquoted and James is often misquoted, even by my favorite hero, Romain, you know, who, who really has a great study on James. You know, and he even messes it up sometimes. You know. But like I said at the beginning of the study, according to as the Lord our God, by the Spirit of God, gives you ears to hear what the Spirit says to you, then accordingly he makes it applicable to you. I happen to know and I make a differentiation between this. In a strictly biblical way, I can answer a biblical answer. I can tell you what the context and the content and the portent of the scripture, where it is, as it is, the way it is, and what it means. That's no problem. Does that mean that it applies to you in that way? No, it doesn't. Because then we would make this a dry, dead book with absolutely no power to change men's lives, but it could influence you intellectually, and you could create for yourself a religion that we call Christianity today. And the Catholics have done it, the Jews have done it. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of sects in Christianity that have done it. Without the Spirit of God, this is just a doctrine that's being presented to you. And one of the systematic theological premises of that is that you know we use this quote-unquote biblical thing where we say it's biblical instead of taking the volume of the book. And I say, hey, I'm more of an integral specificity. If it says what it says, where it is, as it is, the way it is, right there, that's the way it is. Because that's what I'm reading right now as I am, the way I am, what I am, reading it the way God intended it to be because that's what it is. Right here, right now, it is James, the servant of God. It didn't change because I don't have a Greek and I'm not reading the Greek. It's not going to change for me because I go look at the Greek. It's because right now, in this moment in time, this is what I have to deal with and this is the reality of it. And if God questioned me today and he said, what was in James? I'd say, James, the servant of God. Yep, that's what I'd say. That's what it says. So you see the item specificity. It's integral specificity. God instigated this book in order to speak to you where you are today, the moment you are, with what you're going through, with what you're experiencing, with how you're learning it, by way of His Spirit, which is what the Spirit of God and the Bible says to us that we would learn from. You have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God who dwells within you, He will lead you into all truth. He will teach you. He will teach you. And as I just recently read, you know, and it's kind of like, kind of went, oh, I didn't notice that before. You know, Rich was teaching me, a pastor that I know, um, and was sharing in the Word of God, you know, and he taught something, and he said that the Lord teaches you. And I was like, I was like, I gotta reread that. And I haven't had a chance to go back and look. It's in Matthew, I think, 10 or 11, and it says, the Lord teaches you, you know, the, come unto me and learn of me, you know. And it was like, ah, oh, yeah, learn of me, huh? you know, have conversation with him, you know, and God will teach you. And that's why it says, you know, in the Old Testament that they shall be taught of God. And that's the point that you need to learn. Just because you disagree, and you know, just because you have a specificity of an integral, nominal way of looking at it within your biblical statement of saying, well, this is true, 
and it's absolute, it is. It says what it means, it means what it says. Where it is, the way it is, as it is. But you can find there also in that study or word study that you do, hey, the same word was changed in some place else and used a different way. That should enhance you, not remance you into some other kind of abstract idea that takes away from where it's being used as a different word is because it's a different word. That's why they translated it that way. Don't tell me they messed up. But God uses it where he uses it, as he uses it, the way he uses it. And that's what integral specificity means, or the IS. I call it IS because it is what it is, where it is, the way it is. That's the way it is. And he's called the I am, so I just figured the B aspect of God, being that I am that I am, is the whole realization of what God has done in the unveiling and the revelation of this word to us by giving us his spirit so that we can understand in the first place because it's a spiritual book, not just a dead theological, integral, or integrated book of men writing down doctrine, dogmas, and things that we could learn from and itemize, categorize, and designate into certain frameworks that we would only state are, well, this is essential and this isn't. No, it's not. It's all essential. It's how God speaks. It's how he relates to you. So, in relating that, saying it all because of the trials that we fall into, you know, and you can go there with, did you do it or did God did it? How did he do it? Why did he do it? Where is it coming from? How's it going? And how are you going to get through it? You know, you can itemize it down and work it all out, but I want to use it today to speak to a different topic. I want you to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's the point. The trying of your faith. Not you tried and you failed. The trying of your faith. What is something that's tried? What is something that's trying? You know, it's like you kind of you see if it works. You know, I want to relate it in a kind of Jesus freakish way. You know, I want to say, what's the trying of your faith? You say, hey man, if it works, do it. I mean, bluntly, that's what it means. And let's get to it now with what the trials that you're going through. If you're in trials and tribulations. Ask God, because later on you see in James 1.5 where it says, if any man, the whole answer to the entire book, by the way, and the whole answer to your entire life, if you want to really know what all of your life is about, you can boil it down to probably two scriptures that you could live by. Maybe three, but you know, I'll just stick with two because I always like to quote them. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which will give you your direction, your inflection, you know, what you should be doing, how you should be doing it, you know, who you should be listening to, and where you should go with what you do with how you learned it and what you got. You know? Figure it all out. You go with, you know, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So it gives you kind of like, you know, the relationship and the, you know, and all the ways to get to that. To get to there, you got to go through John 3.16. But the point is, you know, you start off with Proverbs 3, 5, 6. And then you go to James 1.5. If you don't know, ask. Get it. You know, Jesus made it simpler. Ask, you'll receive. Seek, you'll find. Not so it shall be open. Learn of me. I'm easy. Hey, take it from me. I'm the horse's mouth. Check with me. You know, I don't got no bridle, do I? You know, you're not leading me by the mouth, but you can read it from the horse's mouth or listen to him speak. And so that's what I mean by when I say, let God pour it on you if you're going through trials. Let him try your faith. Prove now herewith what is the bottom line of your bottom line. I've reduced myself in many ways from all the extra perennious readings and writings, and you know, I read them still, and I write, you know. I still read them, I still write them, but when it comes to talking to people, I remove them far from me. Why would you want to study Augustine, you know, if you don't have a reason to study Augustine? He had some nice things to say. I like them, you know, some of them are good, some of them not so good, some of them are reflective, some of them are objective, you know, some of them are like interesting. Kempis, you know, I mean, I read them all, I love them, I quote them, I give them to people, you know, I say, hey, you know what, if, this, if you enjoy it, use it. If you don't, don't abuse it, just lose it. Quite frankly, out of your life. But if it ministers to your life, if God is using it in your life, then let Him use it on you. You get that now? Your trying of your faith is to be used on you to accomplish His purpose. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask for God to break it down to give it to all men literally. The wisdom is to ask God what's going on. So you want to know what you're going through, not why, but what. You can say, Lord, what am I going through? And he says, read James. I go, oh, okay. Is this from you? And you read farther on. You say, well, he's not tempting you, but he may be leading you. You see, there's a differentiation of how that 
trial you're going through may have been accomplished. If you put yourself into temptation because you didn't pray this morning and say, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we forgive those debts, forgive us our ten, you know, debtors, blah, blah, blah. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you didn't pray for God to lead you in some way, then who led you to where you are? How did you fall into temptation? Your eyes. You know, there was an interesting teacher that said something in Oxford, you know, about idols. And, you know, the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life is what the scripture says. And he changed that into being idols in lust of the eye, I think, and something else. And I went, <laughs> boy. You know, I know why England uses and teaches that because it's the Church of England. You know, I understand where they're coming from. You know, I understand a lot of parameters of sometimes when people say something, what framework they're operating from, and I can say, no, I disagree. You know, I was like, no, that's not what the Bible says. You know, but that may have ministered to you, but it's not what the Bible says. You know, this was a guy that you know is pretty well respected, I think. You know, and it's like, well, you know, okay, cool. You know, I'm happy for you, but if someone's wrong, they're wrong. It doesn't matter if you're the most intelligent man in the world or you're Chuck Smith or anybody. Chuck has got up and said, I was wrong. I changed my mind. And I remember the first time Chuck got up and said, I changed my mind. Ha! <laughs> there were a lot of Chuck guys that went, huh? What? <laughs> you don't walk on water? <laughs> and I was like, Yeah! Oh, baby! <laughs> you tell him, Chuck. Go for it. <laughs> and it was cool. I mean, you could have seen the ripple effect through Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa that night. I was wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> huh? You know, and the way Chuck is, he's always smiling and grinning. You know, so I was like, man, it didn't really. But believe me, behind the scenes, you could watch and see what the effects were. And then, because I worked at the tape lending library, you could hear the talk. Oh, my God. You know, if you don't think that gossip happens at Big Calvary in the old days, <laughs> you should have worked at the tape lending library. After the service, we used to pass out tape. we get these little baggies. We had baggies. And you had a little strip you know, that had your number on it. You know, and you could check out, you know, the service right after the service. You could take a cassette of the service immediately, right after the service. That was challenging, trust me. I mean, we used to pass out hundreds. I mean, and we were moving. You know, I mean, we had only like two wallet sacks that made, like, I think at the time we had one wallet sack. We had separate wallet sacks. We didn't have slave units attached to it. But we had these wallet sacks that duplicate. You put the master in, you put one there, you know, it's kind of, pull it out, slap the label on, you know, and, Type up the labels, you know, and kind of like, you know, and sometimes Chuck wouldn't give the label ahead of time, you know, the name. It was like, hey, 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 Chuck, don't do this to us, you know. And after a while, it got better. But the point is, is that we used to pass out these cassettes, you know, that were inside of baggies, you know, and we'd, you know, give them the baggie, you know, and ran out of baggies after a while. But, you know, you'd get these little baggies with the number in it so that you could remember your number, so that you could take a tape home, you know. And people from all over the world, you know, would come in and get a tape because they'd want to pass it out. and. You were supposed to bring them back, you know, and we'd bring them back, we'd scrape, it was really funny because we'd take a, you know, scissors or whatever, we'd scrape off the label, you know, and reuse them because, you know, there wasn't money, you know, in those days. A lot of ministries at Calvary weren't, you know, funded. <laughs> they were, uh, like, faithful. Like, okay, we're going to do what? Do you realize that we're doing twice as many as what we got? And somehow the Lord always brought the increase, you know. Romaine used to laugh at us, you know, and think, how do you guys do it? And it was like, Lord, you know, we don't really know. And nobody, everybody was too busy to know how we were doing it. We did it, you know. And sometimes, you know, I was there, like, gosh, way after times, you know, Calvary closed down, you know. And, you know, I'm in there just, you know, making copies, you know, or doing whatever that Maddie and I were just finally too tired to do. And I'd say, okay, you know, hey, I'll do it. Let me finish up. You know, you go, you go home, get some sleep, you know, get some rest. You know, you guys are in charge. Let me do it. You know, and, you know, they let me. You know, I mean, I, like, if we had to move the cassettes around for the latest, you know, Sundays, you know, we'd have to expand it and move some other because we had limited room at that point in time. So we'd have to move them around and try to figure out how to move them where they could be seen. You know, people would come wandering in, stuff the place, you know, and wander out. You know, and if you did it for three services, which you did, you know, and you always constantly, you know, people would be like, eh, you know, and you never quite made, you know, the one tape, you know, because it was like people wanted the first service, so they'd get the first service, and people wanted the second service, so they'd get the second service, and people wanted the third service, they'd get, you know, it kind of worked that way. It's the way it used to be until they figured out which was the best service to you know use on the radio and use whatever you know. And then later on, it became easier because they just broadcast live and all kinds of things. But my point of it was this: the people would come in after hearing you know Chuck admit something, and they'd say, "Oh my God, did you hear what Chuck said?" Yeah, Chuck said this. You know, and you, you know, they're like, and we're just standing there behind the counter. What's your number? <laughs> later on, you go. <laughs> you hear that? 
you know, and you laugh about it because you counted it all joy. You rejoiced in the falling into temptation these people fell into. They didn't, you know, fail and come into sin unless it was conceived into sin and they produced it into gossip and made it into something worse by saying, oh, Chuck's, you know, this and he's like off the wall. No, we rejoiced because we saw that the man could say, I made a mistake or I changed my mind or whatever it may have been. And that's what we have to do when we read these things in Scripture. We have to recognize that we can make a mistake. We can fail. We can be wrong. But we could also be going through a trying of our faith to test us to see what is our bottom line. Where are we on foundational truths, on those structures we're building in our life? What are those things that really, when the chips fall, where do you go to and who do you call? I mean, the bottom line is, I'm sitting here going, uh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> no, I'm not calling Ghostbusters. But, you know, I'm kind of going, you know, Lord, you know, I want to go to church, but you know, it's a long way, Lord. You, know, you sure you want me to keep going to church? You know? Okay, you know, or like, you know, my wife's long, far away. You know, we don't really have the money to do this. You know, are you sure you want me to? You know, like, Lord, I don't really have enough money to kind of like, you know, top ramen. It's getting overboard. You know, I'm kind of, kind of ready for some meat. You know, you know do I really have to drink my insurance? <laughs> I have these cans of insurance. It's like, oh God, you know, when I had insurance, you know, I, I have medical necessities that are required of me to keep in my life. Now, you say, oh. Well, you're disabled. Well, sort of, maybe, kind of. Mm, it's iffy, you know. When I don't have insurance, uh, then I don't have it. You know, then I have to get by without it. So, good question about whether I'm disabled. Mm -hmm. Like, mm, well, it's tough. It's rough. Gets kind of questionable. Gets really interesting around my life about that time. It's like, okay, Lord, here we go again. But you know. I have these insurers, you know, and most people know what insurer is now because they've seen it on TV where old folks, you know, they've given to old folks in nursing homes for a long time. Then they realize, oh, hey, you know what? There's a lot of nutrition in those things. Maybe we should, you know, start using this and advertising it as a diet drink. So they started advertising it as a diet drink. Then they said, hey, you know what? People are in the health craze, so we should advertise this as a health drink, you know, and they started advertising a health drink. I remember, you know, all the years, all the things that it's gone through. Still the same stuff. It's just a protein drink that, you know, has 355 calories. You know, I need to maximum calories I can get. But um, it's meant to put protein and calories in me. Not necessarily, you know, because um, I don't absorb things. Things go straight through me very quickly. So it, I have to absorb it in my, my stomach as opposed to my intestines where you normally absorb your nutrients and your vitamins. Kind of like what the tomato plant does, you know, like I said, with those nodules down at the roots levels that are deep waterings, you know, when it finally gets to where they're needing to suck in the moisture. Well, that's kind of what your... Um, terminal ileum does, and your ileum is your bowel, and that's what a bowel is. The bowel is called an ileum, you know, and your ileum is a small bowel, so it's a terminal ileum is a connection between the large bowel and the small bowel, and that's where a lot of your moisture or your fluids are absorbed. A great majority of your vitamins are absorbed there, and then in your large bowel and large intestine, there's also a lot, most of your, 90% of your water is absorbed in your large intestines, and a lot of your vitamins are absorbed there, and I got no large intestines. <laughs> Uh, matter of fact, if somebody wanted to cuss at me, I'd say, well, that's not me. You got the wrong guy. And it's a long story on that one. But, you know, the point being is that, you know, of course, I used to make up this joke about, you know, Frodo Baggins, Bilbo Baggins, I'm your brother. Because <laughs> you know, I have a neoliostomy. I have a bag on my side. So the point being is this, is that having challenges doesn't mean that you respond to those challenges and say, oh, woe is me. I'm so poverty, you know, and I'm so put upon. No, you suck up what you got. You don't suck it up and try to act like a man. You rejoice. You go, God, you're doing this to me. Thank you for what you're doing. You're trying my faith. Let me prove it. Let me demonstrate to you what my faith is. Let me show you how I live. Let me show you what my life is to you, oh God. And let me rejoice now in what you brought to me to be an example just between you and I, God. Nobody can see it. Nobody knows it. Let me rejoice and be happy in it. And so, me, in knowing that and living that all my life, believe me, when you live trials every day, you kind of get you know, along the way. You know, I uh, I don't tell people. You know, most people, you know, they look at me and they <laughs> they think of me as a guy that laughs. 
You know, this is well, you know, it's like, what am I going to do? Drop dead? <laughs> I rejoice. It's like, hey, what am I going to do? You know, hey, you know, I mean, if, if the day came when, you know, I didn't have any money or any food at all in the cupboards, you know, and I didn't have any top ramen, would I have food? Yeah, I've been in Jerusalem where I was no food and no way of getting food. And man, that story was amazing. One minute I had no food, next minute I had a garbage bag stuffed full of of a peanut bread. Hey, man, trust me, I had more bread than I knew what to do with. I could have fed 5,000. Man, talk about going from nothing to feeding 5,000. This bag was big. Of course, it was Shabbos, and so you know you got to get rid of the old bread you know, in order to get new bread because you can't have old bread, so you got to get rid of the old bread before Shabbos starts. So anyways, the point being is that you know, a lot of Jewish homes take all their bread, you know, that they got, that they made for the week, you know, and they kind of tie it up, bind it up, you know, especially Orthodox Jews, and they take it out, you know, and they either give it to the poor, which they really don't, you know, because they're trying to throw it away. But, you know, if you follow them, they set it out next to, like, the dumpsters, or, you know, they don't have dumpsters, but, you know, well, some of them do, you know. But anyway, they set it out where the garbage is, and then they also set it away from the garbage so it doesn't get flies, and they set it farther away so that dogs and cats don't get it, and they set it far enough away so that the poor see it. Now, obviously, that's what it's there for. And there's a Jewish tradition about doing that, you know, cutting the corners of your fields in order to leave part of it unpicked uh, so that the poor people could come and get food. And, you know, I found that true still in Jerusalem today. I went up into the Galil, you know, and I went into an orchard and I was taking three Calvary uh, Bibles, Bible school students that had visited Jerusalem and I took them up into the Galil Galilee, and um, we camped out overnight in an orchard, you know, that um, I think the nuns had it, but I'm not sure, but it was overlooking the, the Sea of Galilee, and we camped up out there, you know, and they were like, you know, they dug out their packs, you know, and they built a little fire, you know, in the orchard, you know, and I don't know if we were supposed to be there or not, we just went there. <laughs> Lord leads, I'm, I'm there, you know. So, yeah, there were three of us, you know, and one was from Italy, I think one was from Yugoslavia, if I remember right. I can't remember for sure. Oh, I think one was from Hawaii, as a matter of fact, and one was from uh, Italy. Yeah, because he taught us how to make Real spaghetti, yeah. <laughs> Big difference, <laughs> Italian style. Anyways, he's from Italy and the other guy was from Hawaii, you know, and they were both over at probably Calvary Seagams or something. I don't know where they were at. But anyways, the point being is that, you know, we had three days to get away from what we were doing to go, you know, be tours, you know. So we did. We split, you know, and went from Jerusalem up to the Galil. It was my only trip out of Jerusalem, you know, in three days. <laughs> That's all I got. You know. So, you know, while we were there, we camped out, you know, and I took off. You know, I went, you know, and I saw that the, you know, orchards had been picked. So I went to the corner of the orchard. Sure enough, there was a fruit tree full of fruit. So I picked a bunch of fruit, brought it back. The guys had already gotten out their, you know, health bars. They'd gotten out their, their little, you know, packages that they had in their backpack to eat. And I said, wow, you guys come prepared, don't you? And I looked down on my fruit, you know, and I was like, bummer when you don't trust the Lord, isn't it? And man, we scarfed on oranges. It was great. Trust me, the fruit in Israel tastes so different, you know, especially if it's from the tree, because everything's fresh there. I mean, and it's also grown differently. Some of it's genetically engineered, you know, so the skin's thinner and everything else, but you know, you don't want to hear that. But the point is, is that it was so good. We, we put away what junk we had, you know, and sure enough, we ate that, you know, and it was like, I went out and found some, I forget what else I found that night. Something else to eat, too, which was like, they began to look at me like I was Wow, he's spiritual. I went, no, I'm just kind of like checking it out and, you know, kind of scavenging, you know, because I'm a dumpster diver. But anyways, I remember God providing in that way. Yeah. And it was a blessing. And that's what the blessing is meant to be in you going through your trials and tribulations. You're meant to see the Lord in them, not be beat down from them. You remember that. See the Lord in them and you can rejoice. See God in the midst of you, going through it with you, and you can be ecstatic about the realization that, hey, you don't know what's going on, and you don't know if you're going to eat that night or not. You know, you might not. I've had times where I went, you know, longer than three days without food. You know, even though the scripture says, you know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his elect begging for bread, came close, real close, really close. You know, almost. You know. Could have been begging, might not have been. I don't know. We're still working on that one. You know, kind of. God and I are arguing about that. You know, he's winning. But the trial of your faith is meant to be that aspect of demonstrating that with which you've come to in the realization of knowing who to go to. Because faith, when you're in the presence of God, will always be increased. You will see and believe and be shocked out of your shorts of what God has done, 
what God reveals. But your faith is made manifest more so when you don't see it and you do believe it. Then when it happens, you rejoice anyways. So if you can rejoice beforehand, you are demonstrating your faith that you know God is there. God is doing it. God is caring. God wants you to realize Him in the midst of it in the front of it, all over it, and that he wants to bring you through it and to it and do to you what he wants to do in demonstrating his faithfulness in the trying of your faith. So you know who you have confidence in. Jesus said it this way, put no confidence in men. I don't put any confidence in my faith. I have no faith. I tell people this over and over again. Now they say, Faith comes by hearing, hear by the word of God. Increase our faith, increase our faith, increase our faith. And I say, yeah, for you, for me, hey, I'm going to go ask God. God, give me the faith I need at the moment because at the moment that I need it, I'm going to need it and require it. And then you increase my faith for that moment that I need it so that I can be demonstrating that which you're doing rather than demonstrating anything I might be doing because if people are following me because of my faith, they're off the wall. You know, I don't have that kind of faith. It's kind of like when I went down to Mexico one time, you know, and there was this... Uh, Missionary outreach, you know, and Chuck talked about, you know, how he prayed for someone's healing, you know, and you know, they didn't get healed, you know, and later on they came back, you know. It's kind of like the same experience. I went down as a translator, you know, and I was translating Spanish into English, which is interesting, and I was translating English into Spanish, which was frustrating, you know, it's kind of like not very good at it, you know. But, you know, I was young and dumb, you know, so 12 of us went, you know, from Calvary, Applegate. Well, it's actually Applegate Christian Fellowship, John Corson's church, and then from uh, Klamath Christian Fellowship, which was an offshoot of uh, Calvary, John Corson's church, had started a, a ministry in Klamath Falls, Oregon, that later became Calvary Chapel, whatever, and then another version of it became Calvary Chapel, Klamath Falls, eventually. <laughs> Don't ask, <laughs> it was a long story, and boy, I lived through all of it. <laughs> Challenging. And um, going down to Mexico, I remember this one bro, you know, he was like, you know, into Corson's church where they lay hands, you know, people are healed, you know, they're sick and raised, you know, they walk on water, you know, they do all that kind of stuff, you know. It's like, well, you know, Klamath, we just cast out demons, you know. <laughs> Believe me, there's demoniacal in Klamath, and we had to do that. People walk into church screaming, grab them and pray, you know. Lord, deliver this sucker, or do whatever you're going to do, God, but shut them up. Wow, that worked. Cool, you know. They were like blessed. You know, it's like, well, thank you. You know, and they walk out and, they're like, huh? Wonder what that was. I don't know. Let's go do a teaching. But um, when I went to Mexico, because I was a translator, this one guy was, you know, from Calvary, you know, of course, and he was kind of young and naive and kind of like new in the faith, you know, and he was kind of like, you know, drags me along and he finds this guy, you know, at one of the people's church, you know, or one of the people's homes, you know, and he was impoverished. He was up in the dumps in Tijuana, you know. At that time, it was dumps in Tijuana. Nowadays, it's probably apartment complex. But it was like really bad, poor and impoverished, you know, way back, way back when. And so um, we were there building a church, and um, the guy was laying there with, you know, arms and legs that were like about this big around. Well, legs about this big around. You know, whatever he had, we don't know. You know, and Mama Sita was, uh, she was uh, the female pastor, you know, because as we found out, you know, that quote unquote, you know, I don't want to give away something about who was there because he went through a challenge on this. He had to deal with whether or not he was going to build a church for a woman pastor because, you know, where they were going, they didn't know. And when they got there, you know, this was the place that God sent them. But guess what? It wasn't the way that they wanted it to be because it wasn't a woman. It wasn't acceptable for a woman to be a pastor. And then we, when I translated it, I told the whole story about how she had prayed for years and years and how the men that she had taught, you know, at this church that she had basically wound up pastoring. She had raised them up and they would leave, you know, the church and go into America to earn money, you know, and never come back. You know, and they would leave the children behind, you know, and the children would grow up and they would, you know, she would teach them and they would leave and go to America. And it was like, I mean, just heartbreaking story. Just, ah, oh, you know, and I'm crying while I'm telling this, translating the story, you know. And, you know, there I say, Stykoff, I think it was Stykoff, yeah. Stykoff, I think it was his last name. Anyways, he was from, you know, he was like, manly man, you know, he's like, we're, you know, this isn't what the Lord does, you know. It is what the Lord did. <laughs> you know, so we built a church there, you know, and they, you know, it's still there. But the point is this. One of the guys from there, you know, had taken me to this home, you know, and it was poor, and the people were there, and I'm going, Lord, I don't, you know, because I was like, I'm doing healing, because first of all, I'm not healed. I mean, God had healed me of lots of things at different times in my life. 
But, you know, one, he said, like with Paul, you know, if you need this affliction, keep you humble, whatever, meek, you know. Servant of Satan, you know, piercing on the side, you know, some people say eyes, whatever. Anyways, I got mine, you know, and I know what mine's for, so don't go there. But my point is, is that, you know, I wasn't big on healing. I had prayed for people's healings, you know, I've seen some things, but not much. You know, so it was like, you know, I didn't have faith to believe this, you know, so it was like, it ain't gonna happen. So this guy's, I know what's coming, you know, because I'm sitting there, you know, and he's like, he's bringing, you know, he's brought into the home. He sees this guy laying down in the bed, you know, and I'm going, he's going to tell me to get on the other side. He told me to get on the other side. He's going to tell me to lift this guy up and tell him to stand and walk. And I'm going to say, I'm going to look at him and say, uh-uh, you know. And the Lord said, shut your mouth. Not really. He said, hm. almost like be thou silent. I think it was more like, no. <laughs> God kind of uses yes and no with me. Pretty straightforward. No question or quibble when he wants me to know what he's saying. So, I kind of heard the Lord and went, you know, I was kind of like silent waiting for the Lord to tell me more, and he didn't say anything. So the guy says, Michael, you know, tell him we're going to lift this guy up. I said, Perdóname, le levante el, levante el, you know, uh, you know, something like that, you know. Anyways, I told him that we wanted to lift him, you know, so we're going to lift him up, you know. Uh, so, we got on both sides, lifted him up, and bam, the guy fell flat on his face. You know, and man, I was mad. That moment on, I was furious. Matter of fact, I was so mad. I wasn't mad at the guy, although I was kind of like ticked at him. I was furious at God. You made a fool of me, Lord. You made me look stupid in front of all these people. What, pardon the expression, what the hell are you doing? You know, is this the kind of God I serve? You make me look like an idiot in front of all these people? I'm doing the best I can. I don't know that much Spanish. I'm pretty good at you know what I do know, but what little I do know isn't enough, so you go and put me as a translator, and I can't translate, and then some idiot takes me into some place where I can't do this, and I don't have faith enough to believe it anyway, so I don't even know why you're doing me to this, and why am I here, you know, and I'm having problems as myself, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get through all this, and it's like, you know, it's hard, and it's hot, and you know, here we are in Monte Ore, you know, and I used to sleep up on top of the mountain above the little village, you know, looking down on it, you know, well, it's a hill, really, you know, and so I went up there, and I was mad, and I was arguing, and I was telling God all what for, and how for, and why for, and you know, everything else that I could give for to God, why he should be, you know, something more than what he is, because after all, being God, he's not big enough, and he's not smart enough, and he's not using it the right way, so he ought to resign and let me be in charge, because after all, he's not God, I could do a better job, and I was convinced of it, by golly, so, you know, next day, of course, you know, I'm like, mad. I ain't talking to God. Fine, Lord. I ain't talking to you. You know, and I got away with it for all day. God didn't talk to me. <laughs> I kind of like miffed. I'm not talking. I don't care. You know, and so I went about my ministry things that I was supposed to do that day. I'm hammering nails. You know, we're building a frame, you know, for the, out, for the frame of the church, you know. We were laying it, you know, and doing it and whatever. You know, and so that night, you know, every night we had services, you know, and so, <laughs> me, having to translate, because nobody spoke Spanish, you know, we'd have, you know, Dave would give a teaching and I'd be translating it, you know, and so I'm standing there, you know, like he's saying something, you know, and he looks at me and I go, <laughs> do the best I can with what he just said. I, I kept telling him, Dave, could you keep it simple, you know, so, translation is not direct interpretation. I said translation, you know, remember I said that, not, not interpreting Okay, maybe I was interpreting or not translating. Either way, I did the best I could. You know, I was, you know, I was anointed, so God gave me a lot of extra ability at that time, you know, which is neat. So then, you know, we're like there, you know, and we're going on, you know, and David's giving this really cool teaching, you know, and I'm like, okay, cool, you know. And then there's, we were always up in the front because they always want to make, you know, the missionaries sit up front, you know, like up at the stage. There were no stage, but it was just kind of like the front of the building, you know. And it was all lit by candles, you know. I mean, oil kind of like burning kerosene lamps or whatever. And, you know, it's kind of poor, you know. I mean, it's pretty dirt dirt floor, by the way. Forgot to mention that. And there were benches. Yeah. We're building walls and roof over it. You know? So, anyways, a lot of people there, though, because, you know, we're the newbies, you know, on the block, maybe, you know. And so, uh, by golly, right down the middle, you know, I see this guy coming. You know, there's this big commotion. This guy comes walking down the middle. The front benches, and he goes over and sits down in the front. This guy, pretty an old man that didn't have anything. 
and when we wanted to lay hands on them, you know, they they had like, you know, this jar of oil, you know, that they wanted to you know, pray for the man. And so, you know, the the guy from Corson's church wanted to take, you know, his little finger, you know, kind of like, you know, do his little X on his forehead. And Mama Sita grabbed it and says, no, that's not what you do. You know, so I translated it. And she says, here, pushed up the legs, you know, pushed up the pant legs and the bean pole legs that were just bony that I remembered from my days of being like that, where you have no muscular, you have no fat content. She says, here, this is what you do. You missionaries, you pray like this. And she started lathering his legs and rubbing them with her hands. And she said, now, and she grabbed our hands and we prayed for him and we pushed on his legs until we were poured out all that one jar of oil on him. And when I picked him up and dropped him, I was furious. And when he walked and sat in the front of the church, his legs looked new. They weren't pink, but they had they had muscles, or they had fat, they had definition. They weren't the same legs that I saw when I prayed for them. I realized that moment in my life that, uh, no, I, I don't have faith. You know, and my faith would be tried all the time. I don't have the greatest ministry in the world or the smartest intellect, although sometimes I think so. But I have a God who has rescued me, who has saved me, who has never embarrassed me in everything I've tried and done in His name. And He has always come through in every way, shape and form. Even to the point where I, I just had nothing to say. But I stood in awe of that, that moment, that man, and that time. But to this day, I'm still amazed by my God. Because I can rejoice in so many things that I go through now. Because I remember all the times I got mad about the things I used to get mad about. And that's what brought me to the place of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Where I can trust because I've been tested, because I've been tried, and I've been faithful. Not faithful because I had great faith. Not faithful because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I was faithful to what James 1, 5 says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. And I did. And he came through. And he showed me what he can do. And I always go to Him for everything that I do. Every time I don't understand. Every time, every time I want to know what are you doing? What do you want me to do? How do you want to do it? What do you want to accomplish? I go to Him. I don't just go to my rock. I just don't go to some tower. I don't go to some metaphysical or metaphorical idealism. I go to a direct realization of God in my life. And I talk to Him and I say, God, I'm not moving until you tell me what to do. I'm not lifting up a man and making him fall flat on his face unless you're going to heal him. And I'm not going to ever deny you for anyone or be mad about how you do things. Ever. Because you are God. 